Hey everyone, today I've got a 32 bar jazz piano improvisation for you to have a go at and this is going to be ideal for those of you who have done my jazz piano for beginners course right here on YouTube. But even if you haven't seen that course, if you're just getting into jazz piano and you want to see a solo broken down and taken to pieces and demystified, then this tutorial will help you. I'm going to assume that you have some basic ability on the piano, that you understand fundamental concepts like key and time signature, and you have a basic knowledge of what a chord is. And if I use terms like inversion or voicing to talk about the chord shapes that I'm using, hopefully you'll be on board with that. But don't worry if you're not or if your knowledge is a little bit shaky because I will go through as much as I can as we go. Now on the subject of chords, here is the progression we're going to be working on. As I said, it's 32 bars long, 32 measures long. If you prefer the US terminology, it's in the key of E flat major and it's in 4-4 four, four time. What I'm going to do right now is play through it, improvising. I'm just going to go through it once. And as I play, I'll put the chords in subtitles under the keyboard so you can kind of follow along. Now, bear in mind that those chords you see on screen will be the basic underlying chords of the progression. But one of the things we do in jazz piano is kind of alter and enrich and substitute the chords we're using. Yeah, So what I'm actually play playing on the keyboard might be slightly different from the chords you see in the subtitles. But we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Once you've heard the improvisation, we'll go back, we'll talk about the technique that I was using will go through all the chords that I used and then we'll take my uh, improvisation to bits step by step and analyze exactly what I did. Okay so here we go first of all let's have a listen to it. So let's kick off by going through the basic chords that we're using here. Here's the chord progression again. As I said, don't get freaked out if it looks really complicated because I'm going to be going through the whole thing in just a second. If your chord knowledge is a little bit on the shaky side, by the way, you might benefit from having a look at my book, How to Really Play the Piano, the stuff your teacher never taught you. And one of the things it does, among many other things, is explain basic chords and how they work and how to read chord symbols and stuff like that. You need to read, uh, need to be able to read a little bit of basic sheet music to make sense of it. But if you can do that, then it will show you how to understand chords and then how to do loads of cool things with them, like get started with improvisation and playing pop piano and blues and jazz and all of that kind of thing. Um, it's available as a print edition and as an ebook, and you'll find links to it in the description text underneath the video and in the little YouTube card in the top right hand corner. Check that out afterwards. For now, let's have a look at these chords in the progression. And our very first chord in bar number one is E flat major seven, like this. Okay, so that's a basic E flat chord which is the tonic chord in the key of E flat major, the number one chord with a major seventh added, that's a D. So E flat major seven. And I can play it in various, like any chords, I can play it in various voicings and inversions. All of those are E flat major seven chords, some combination of E flat G, B flat and D. So that is our first chord. No surprise to find it as our first chord because we are in the key of E flat major. In bar two, we start off with F minor seven, okay? 
So a basic F minor chord with a, a seventh added for F minor seven. And then we get B flat seven. Now those chords are slightly unevenly divided across the bars. And if you look at the progression, you'll see that I've put little strokes underneath the chords to indicate three beats of one and one beat of the other. OK, so three beats of F minor seven, one beat of B flat seven. Usually, if you see a bar with two chords in separated by a comma and no strokes or no other markings, it means split the bar evenly in half between the two chords. So that would be two beats of one chord and two of another. But here, because I've got one, two, three, one. OK, I've put the strokes in to show how um, the, the, the changes work against the underlying beat. OK, so that is bar two. Bar three is G minor seven, okay. There's a G minor seven and various voicings and inversions. G B flat D F. And in bar four C nine, which is one of those chords, it's difficult to play with just one hand, yeah, because it's got five notes. C E G. It's a basic C chord, a non-diatonic chord in the key of E flat major. If you're a bit of a music theory nerd, don't worry if you're not. Um, and then a B flat and a D for C nine. Bar five, we're back to F minor seven. Okay, F minor seven. And then in bar six, we've got a B flat seven chord. Okay, now ordinarily that is B flat seven, but you'll see that I've put it in square brackets. And that's because when you're playing jazz, to find um, this chord in this particular position, chord, you will probably be, probably play some sort of extension or substitution of it. Yeah, so that's because the B flat chord or B flat seven chord is what we call the dominant chord in the key of E flat. It's a, a fifth above the tonic note, and it resolves very strongly down to the E flat chord, the tonic chord. Okay, so it's the point of maximum tension. It's the, the furthest part out from the from the tonic chord, yeah, furthest point out in the progression, sort of harmonically, and it wants to take us back to E flat. But usually in jazz, we would substitute that for another chord that does the same job, that has the same function, to use the technical term, but doesn't sound quite as kind of square, doesn't sound quite as neat and tidy, yeah. So B flat to E flat is very kind of, yes, very neat and straightforward. But in jazz, we want to do something different, so we do something. We do something like that, we substitute a completely different chord. Yeah, well, I'll show you exactly how I did that when we go through the um, progression in detail and later in the tutorial. Okay, so that's bar six. Um, in bars seven and eight, we've got a turnaround section. Okay, so this is designed to take us back to the start. We've got four chords across two bars. You'll see there are no strokes under any of those chords, so that means we've just got two beats on each chord, and it's all chord, they're all chords. Um, that we've seen apart from C minor 7, so it's E flat major 7 and C minor 7 in bar 7, and then in bar 8 we're back to F minor 7 and B flat 7. A little bit of a cheeky suspension I've dropped in there, yeah. That B flat 7 you might substitute, you might not, yeah, okay, but again I've written it in square brackets just to show that it is a possible one for substitution. Now, the next eight bars are exactly the same, and that's because the whole structure of this chord progression is what we call AABA. So we've got um, the first lot of eight bars, then the second lot of eight bars, which are exactly the same. Then we've got an eight bar middle section, which I'll play in a second. But then we go back to the A section. OK, so we haven't got actually quite as many chords to go through as you might think. So those are our first eight bars and the chords in them. We play those twice to give us the first 16 bars and then we get to the middle section. Now, the first chord in our middle section, our B section, is A minor 11, which in principle looks like that, which clearly is an awful lot of notes. So what we tend to do when we're playing jazz piano, when we have these very heavily extended chords like 11ths and 13ths, is just be selective about the notes we use. We don't use all of them. We just use enough to give a flavour of the chord. So what I was doing typically was missing out the E and the B and just playing A, C, D and G as my A minor 11 chord. Then we have a straightforward D7 chord. OK, we're way non-diatonic to E flat major here. We've kind of got a bit of a key change. It's not entirely clear what key we're in, but the key, the tonality, if you want to use a technical term, has definitely moved away from E flat major. Then we've got two bars, bars 19 and 20. G major 7, so a basic G chord with a major 7th added G, B, D, 
F sharp. Then that resolves down in the next bar, this is going to be bar 21, just make sure I'm not losing count here, to G minor 7, which we've seen before. Yeah, we're kind of back on home territory now, we're getting back to our home key. Then in bar 22, we've got C9 again, bar 23, F minor 7, bar 24, we've got one of those bracketed B flat 7 chords which we can substitute out for another chord which does the same job, we'll look at that in detail shortly, and then we're back in bar 25 to our A section again, so we're straight back to our E flat major 7, F minor 7, B flat, G minor 7, just what we saw at the start. So those are how the basic chords work. Now we know a bit about the chords I was using, let's just have a think about what was going on in the right hand. I was being quite careful to limit myself to only playing melodic improvisation, yeah? So it was very much one note at a time. And I did that in order to keep things nice and clear and easy to explain. If I wanted to, I could have dropped some chords into the right hand. I could have used some chord shapes. I could have played some um, licks and riffs that involve playing more than one note at a time. but for the most part, and I think almost entirely, I was just playing a melodic improvisation. Now, how did I know which notes I could play and when? Yeah, how do you, if you like, make it up as you go along? It's a difficult process to describe, but really the best way to, to, to describe it is to say that it's an instinct that you have to cultivate, okay? It's not something that you can learn to do right away, but you need to gradually build up the skill. So how do you do that? Well, if you're a beginner, the thing to do is to start off by limiting yourself very, very strictly, perhaps just to one note at a time. So, you know, you learn, learn the chords in the left hand and then just improvise on a single note in the right. And then go out to two notes. Or whatever and gradually build out from there. I'm not going to go into that process in detail now because it's something I've covered before in my Jazz Piano for Beginners series which is right here on YouTube entirely free of charge. I'll put a playlist link to that in the description text underneath this video. But that is essentially what you are doing with improvisation. You're starting in a very limited way and gradually building out and learning the effects that the different notes have. Now, no note is off limits. You can take any note of the piano keyboard and use it for a melodic improvisation in any key. There are no wrong notes. Very important attitude to have. The only thing is that some notes sound better or more effective than others in particular contexts. So how do you know which notes are most likely to sound right? Well, that's a case of going to the underlying scales that we're using and dragging the notes out of there. So the most fundamental scale that we're going to use when we're improvising in E flat major is the E flat major scale. E flat F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D and E. And all of those notes cropped up rather a lot. But that's kind of fairly plain vanilla, so we're going to be using other notes as well. Now, to make things safer for yourself, one thing you can do is focus particularly on the notes of the pentatonic scale. Okay, E flat, F, G, B flat, C, and back to E at the top. So the same as the major scale, but just the first, second, third, fifth and sixth notes. OK, so you're missing out the fourth and the seventh notes. The great thing about the pentatonic, as you may know, is that it is always safe ground as long as you're in the key of E flat major. Now, that, that obviously will cause complications for us when we come to our kind of key change in the middle section. But for now, in, in our A sections, when we're in E flat, then the E flat major pentatonic will save it, will serve as well. And if you if you're just kind of getting used to um, jazz, one of the first things you could do is just to play around with the pentatonic. OK, E flat, F, G, B flat, C, wherever it happens to fall on the piano keyboard. And those notes will sound, always sound pretty much OK, especially against the A sections. They wouldn't sound too bad against the B sections. The B section, it would be a little bit more crunchy, but not too bad. So that is one place for you to start with the pentatonic. If we want a sound that is a bit harder, a bit edgier, we can also go to the blues scale. Now, there are various different ways of playing the blues scale, some with fewer notes and some with more notes, but very roughly, something like that. The important notes there are the flat third, the G flat, the flat fifth, 
which strictly speaking is B double flat, but we'll call A just to, to say kind of throwing our brains. Yeah, and the flat seventh. OK, so um, if we when we're improvising, if we drop in G flat, A or D flat, that's going to give us a kind of edgier kind of sound. Mix those in with the notes of the major scale, uh, with the notes of the pentatonic scale. But other notes are absolutely fine as well. You know, you might use things like the um, the flat ninth, just for that extra kind of edgy sound. But bear in mind that once you go far away from the E flat scale, then things will sound more kind of radical, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. You might want these kind of. Yeah, that might be quite a cool effect you're after, yeah, to play the B natural there. So no note is wrong. It's just a question of learning which notes sound good in the particular context that you're playing and for the particular effects that you want. And the only way to do that is to play around and to practice. The only time you would actually play a, a pure scale is on a run. OK, if you know, if you want a particular run up the keyboard or whatever. And I think I only did that once and it was on whole tone scale. Whole tone scales are really, really cool and really great effect. And basically you start on a particular note and you play to, to generate it is easy. You just play whole tones all the way up. So um, whole steps rather than half steps. OK. Or you can start on uh, the white note. There are basically only two whole tone scales. Yeah, and I, I use one of those, I think, towards the end of the improvisation. So what about your left hand? Now, a very common mistake that people make when they're starting up with jazz piano is to assume that they need to do more with their left hand than is actually the case. Um, you can actually create nearly all the rhythm and all the harmony you need with a fairly minimal left hand, at least in this style. Yeah, there are some styles like stride where you have to have a busy left hand because that's, you know, the, the whole idea of the style. But here you can get away with something really quite simple and straightforward. That's not to say it's easy to play because obviously you have to time it against your right. But don't feel that you have to do more. Yeah, you can have this kind of burning feeling when you're practicing a piece. You think, you know, I, I have to do more in the left hand. And usually you can get away with less than you think. So most of the time I was just playing these block chords. There were some exceptions to that, which I'll talk about in a second. But I was playing the block chords and just adding a little bit of rhythmic interest. Just let me play through a few bars and, and look at my left. OK, um, all block chords there, straight onto the um, E flat major seven, F minor seven, three beats, one beat of our B flat then to the G minor 7 shape there. But then when I went to the C9, I anticipated it a little bit. So I was on the G minor 7 and I just went bum, da, ba, da, ba, da, da. Yeah, so I came in a little bit ahead of the beat with a little extra stab on the G minor 7. It's not very much, OK? It is very, very minimal. And generally, that is all you have to do to create the rhythmic interest that you need. So mostly block chords. There were some exceptions. And that was when I came down a little bit lower because naturally I was varying things a little bit. You don't want to play the, the left hand the same way through every single time unless you're focusing on your right. If you're focusing on your right, it can be good to memorise the left hand so it's fairly automatic. So you can just give all your attention to your right. But when you're performing, we want a bit of variety. So one of the things that I did in bar two, um, I think I went from the F minor seven chord and I jumped down rather than doing that change. I did this, I went to the B flat and the G minor seven there. Now notice what I'm doing differently there. I have all these three fingers in the middle. I'm not playing a block chord. Now, as you may know, if you've watched a lot of my tutorials in the past, that's because the further down the piano keyboard we go, the wider apart we space our chord notes, yeah? And that's because the lower a note is on the piano keyboard, the more audible overtones 
it has, and the more those overtones fight with each other. And let's not get into the physics of it, but that's basically what's going on. So if we play a big chord all the way down here, it sounds really muddy and mushy. So once we get below kind of, I guess, that C, it kind of varies by piano, we start to miss some of the notes out of the chord. And all I was doing there was playing what we call a shell chord. I went from shell chord there, shell chord B flat 7, to shell chord G minor 7. Because we've already heard a G minor 7, then just the G and the F, typical kind of shell chord shape there, that's enough to tell our brains and tell our listeners' brains what chord is being implied there. Okay, so the further you go down the piano keyboard, the wider apart you need to space your notes, the more you need to use shell chords. Now, as I said at the start, if you know a little bit about chords, you might have noticed that when I was playing those left hand chords, they didn't always exactly match the underlying chords in the progression. And that's because as jazz piano players, one of the first things we do is look at the chords we're working with and figure out how we can extend them, enrich them, substitute them to create a kind of um, a more interesting sound. Now, that is a huge subject. I don't have time to go into it all here because we'll be here for hours. But if you want to know more about it, then do check out my Jazz Piano for Beginners course. Uh, also on YouTube, as I said, playlist link below. But just to give you a flavour, you know, I, I could have done all sorts of things there. I actually kept it fairly plain vanilla. But for example, I could have taken that F minor 7 chord and played it as an F minor 9, perhaps missing out the root altogether. So effectively, I was substituting in uh, an A minor 7 chord. But an A flat minor 7 chord, but I tended not to do that. I kept most of the chords fairly ordinary, except those B flat 7 chords that I put in square brackets, yeah? Because as I said, I want to avoid the plain vanilla B flat 7 to E flat. That sounds just too boring, yeah? I played the straightforward B flat 7 when it was a passing chord in bar 2, because then it's very brief. I'm not going to the tonic anyway. You know, that's quite a cool move. But when it came to the real points of resolution, I avoided the B flat 7. Instead, I substituted, and the typical substitution that I used was a tritone substitution. Now, a substitution is basically where you replace one chord with another chord that has the same function. In other words, it does the same job in the chord progression. And the job here is to take us back neatly to the tonic chord. Yeah? Tritone substitution is something like that in the key of E flat major. Okay, so that's basically what looks like an E7 chord, that's what it is, with a B flat in the bass. And it's called the tritone substitution because what you do, you take your regular um, uh, number five chord, B flat uh, seven here, and you find the note that is a tritone above its root, which in this case is E, then you build the dominant seventh chord off it, and then you can add in the original root if you want. Okay, and that resolves really nicely to our E flat major seven, or even straight to E flat major. Yeah, but without that kind of that kind of boring, you know, five one, that very traditional sound. Okay. And I use that actually in various ways. So other things you can do is, I mean, sometimes I I put in that B flat in the bass, and sometimes I I don't I, I might have missed out a few times. I think I didn't bother, um, or I think I might have done that as well, where I played it with a flat ninth. Okay, so effectively it becomes an F diminished seven chord, perhaps with a, a B flat in the bass, or you could do kind of something like. Um, uh, an A flat minor with a major seven uh, with a B flat in the bass, all kinds of stuff you can do there. But all of those chords will do the same job. As I said, have a look at my Jazz Piano for Beginners course for more ideas. In a second, I'm going to get the improvisation back on screen and go through exactly what I did. Just before I do, I want to say a quick word about this B section, okay? The little section that starts with this A minor 11 chord, okay? Just to remind you, we've got A minor 11, D7, then two bars of G major 7. If you're looking at your chord progression, then G minor 7, C9, F minor 7, and then we've got B flat 7 in the progression, but we're probably substituting to something like a tritone sub, and then back out to the start of the final A section. Now, what we have got there is what we might call a change of tonality. We are moving away from the E flat major sound. I don't, I'm, I'm deliberately avoiding calling it a key change because it's not really obvious what new key we've moved to. We could say that the A minor 11, D7, 
G uh, major seven uh, little sequence there kind of has a G major tonality to it. OK, we'll come back to that in a second. But then as soon as we're going back to G minor seven, C9, F minor, we're getting much closer to the uh, E flat sound. And when we finally get to that, uh, that dominant substitution at the end, we're, we're right back on home territory. So what do you do there with when that kind of tonality change happens? How does that affect what you play in your right hand? Um, it doesn't have to affect it at all. You could stick to playing around with your, your notes of, um, you know, centered around the E flat scales if you wanted to. So, for example, let's just try playing around with the E flat pentatonic. That sounds kind of okay. A little bit edgy, a little bit bluesy, but it kind of works. The other thing you could do is try to identify the kind of key we have moved towards. Now, I would suggest especially given the presence of that D7 and the G major 7 there, that we're closer to the uh, tonality of G major, at least for those four bars, those four measures. So A minor 11, D7 and two bars of G major 7. We are closer to a G major tonality. So you could play around with that and, you know, maybe use some of the blue notes from the G major scale, which will be B flat, D flat and F. Um, I always think that's quite a nice sound. F sharp in the D in the bass, F natural at the top. Yeah, you can do that. The other thing I was doing was dropping in the A flat. Yeah, but as soon as you get back to the G minor 7 chord, really we're kind of getting back to our E flat tonality so you can play around with those original notes much more. The mentality I want you to avoid is we've changed keys, therefore I must change the scale I am improvising on. Yes, if you're doing a run, fine, but it really doesn't matter. And as in so many other things, as I said earlier, it comes down to kind of using it here and figuring out which notes are right for the effect that you want to achieve. OK, there we go. Now let's get the improvisation back on screen and step by step go through exactly what I did. OK, so here we are back at the start of the improvisation. I'm just going to play it through and mention a few things as we go along. Just to start with, focus on what I'm doing in the right hand. OK, here we go. OK, so what I'm starting with there is just a really kind of simple motif. Yeah, when people start improvising, they think they have to be complicated. It's like I was saying about the left hand earlier. You really don't. Actually, it's more important to be musical, to, to be melodic, to give the notes and phrases room to breathe. Now, the word phrases is really important there. You'll notice that I have three phrases in that little section, two short ones and one long one. Let's see if we can just hear those again. So phrase number one, phrase number two, and phrase number three. Now, improvising melodically is a little bit like having a conversation. When you talk to somebody, you don't use the same sentence length all the time. You kind of, you, you kind of mix up short sentences and long sentences and, and, and those somewhere in, in between. And this is kind of the same. If all your phrases were the same length, if there were no spaces between them, when you were talking, it would sound kind of unnatural. So what I'm after is a natural, natural flow, a natural rhythm, something kind of conversational, yeah? Now, in the left hand, as you can see, I'm just playing the block chords with just a little bit of rhythmic messing about, but not very much at all. It's all really quite straightforward. Let's keep going. There's our first tritone substitution. So instead of the B flat seven chord that's in the progression, I've hit that E7. And in just a sec, you'll hear me hit that B flat in the bass there. Here we go. Just to thicken up that substitution. Now, let's hear that again. Oops. Here we go. E flat, E7. Cool. There's our turn around. Yeah, a little bit of a, um, a bluesy touch. Um, I started off playing blues piano when I was a kid before I even thought about jazz. And um, it still kind of it inflects all my jazz playing to this day. In fact, all my playing, you know, to my mind, jazz isn't jazz without a little bit of the blues. Um, so no, I, I'm, I'm just putting that in there to kind of punctuate it. Let's keep going. 
another kind of similar phrase to the one I started with, but this time I've developed it in a different way. And again, this is a very common thing you do. You play a simple phrase and then you develop it. Let's just hear that again. Quite similar to the first one, but then developing upwards. Okay, getting more complicated in the right there. And notice what I've done differently in the left. Now I'm down playing those shell chords for a bit of variety. Okay, nice crunchy crush notes there. And instead of sliding from the F sharp uh, to the G, as I might do G flat to the G, um, I'm, I'm just squashing the two together, which can be a really nice sound, really nice percussive sound. People often forget that the piano, as well as being a melodic and a harmonic instrument, is also a percussion instrument. You hit it, yeah? So sometimes the way you hit it can, can give you different effects. Yeah, nice. Listen also to the dynamics. I've kind of got louder there and kind of hit a peak around those crush notes, yeah? I'm always thinking about my softs and louds. Now easing off a bit again, easing right down, yeah? So also think about the, um, as well as the shape of your phrases, think about the dynamic shape of your overall playing. I know this seems like a lot to think about, but it should become instinctive after a while. Um, and it's this stuff that is more important than that obsessing about scales that so many people do. Am I allowed to play this scale here or that scale there? Blah, 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 blah. Forget all that. Play the notes that sound right. Learn which notes sound right. And focus on the musicality. I say this in virtually every video, but it's so important. Focus on the dynamics and the expression and all of that stuff. OK, that's and, and the conversationality of your phrases, what we were talking about a second ago. OK, before I start lecturing you about that stuff, let's carry on. Turn around again. Now we're into the middle section. Notice that little transition I did there. I didn't go straight onto the A minor 11 chord, but I got my thumb on the D. Instead of going to the E, G, A, I hit each of the notes a semitone below them, just to give me a bit of a cool lead in there. Let's just watch that. Okay, just a bit of variety and interest. Now I'm mainly kind of playing around with a kind of G blues tonality in the right here. If you remember, we had that discussion a few minutes ago. Um, and that's kind of working pretty well for me. But now, as soon as we hit that G minor seven chord, we're, we're, we're swinging back into that E flat tonality really quite quickly. And now we're well back. And there we've got the, um, yeah, a plain playing B flat chord. I actually put in, in, con in complete contradiction to what I said earlier. I put in a B flat chord at the end of the second A section as well, I think. Um, if you do it kind of discreetly and have uh, make sure you've got some interesting stuff going on in the right, you can get away with it, actually. I do it all the time. All this stuff about, oh, yes, always substitute your B flat sevens. You don't need to do that at all, you know. So uh, it just shows what I know. There's a, there's a world of difference between what I say and what my fingers do when I sit down at the piano keyboard. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Final A section. Nice little twiddle there. Every jazz piano player should have a good twiddle. There we go. Woo, nice. Going quite delicate here, quite soft. It's so much harder actually to improvise softly than it is loudly. Anyone can bash the piano. The trick is, if you can, to be able to, as I, as I was saying, vary your dynamics, kind of make it sing a little bit more, and that often means going soft. That's quite an interesting substitution there. I've done for my B-flat 7. There we go. It's A-flat, C, D, and G. And that's kind of like a, a B-flat 7 with an added 6th and ninth but with the B flat and the F taken out, I guess. Or you could call it lots of other things, but it's quite a nice substitution for the plain vanilla B flat seven chord. Let's hear it again. And just a nice simple ending there. Okay, often jazz improvisations end on a, a major seventh or ninth, but sometimes it's nice to have that nice little sweet ending just onto the tonic. Something I forgot to mention a minute ago, by the way, was my... Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Whole tone scale. This was at the end of the middle section. I mentioned running up scales. Here we, here we go. 
yeah, that's uh, that whole tone scale run up. And notice how I was making it stand out. I've got the funky sound from the whole tone scale, but I'm also kind of slightly setting it off the beat, yeah? But also creating a contrast. So we go from the, the real tension of the whole tone scale and the, and the offbeat rhythm just to the tonic. So contrast, release, tension, release. That's, you know, that's the soul of music in so many ways. Let's hear that again. Bum, 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 and then the dynamic comes down, and there we go. That was just an excuse to hear that twiddle again. <laughs> okay, so that's about it. Hopefully, you will now be able to take that chord progression and just play around with it a little bit. Remember, you can download the whole PDF of the progression if, using the link in the description text below. If you want to learn more about these concepts, then as I said, my Jazz Piano for Beginners series, which is right here on YouTube, all entirely free, it will help you. It goes through the whole thing in much more detail. Getting started with improv, substitutions, extensions, all of that stuff is right there. If you want to really beef up your basic knowledge, then as I said earlier, my book, How to Really Play the Piano, the stuff your teacher never taught you, will explain stuff like, you know, what a G major seven chord is and what a diminished seven chord is and how to read chord symbols and all that kind of fundamental stuff that I've kind of taken for granted today, but which you might need, you might want to learn a little bit more about. It also tells you about how to get started with improvisation, actually. There's a whole chapter on improvising 12 bar blues. I, I think 12 bar is the, the single best way to get into improvisation. So you just need to look, be able to read a little bit of sheet music to use how to really play the piano but lots of people really really love this book and um, kind, of, kind of surprises me when I wrote it I, I never expected it to be expected it to be as hugely popular as it has been print and ebook editions are both available I will include links in the description text below and as I said in the top right hand corner of the video screen in one of those YouTube cards okay so that's it if you've got any questions or comments please stick them in the comment thread remember to follow me on social media Twitter Facebook and Instagram links are all below and please do check out my Patreon crowdfunding campaign at patreon.com slash Bill Hilton. There we go. Go and grab that chord sequence, have a play around with it, ask me any questions. I'll see you next time.